Hello and welcome to our weekly share with the commentary of the Alsha Kodesh. Thanks as usual to Tara Anytime for hosting, as they do every single week, um, my uh, Alsha share and occasionally other things. So thanks to them for the remarkable work. And, and I just can't imagine the discussion that they generate from all the Tara that they publicize and circulate throughout the Jewish world. Discussing are enormous. Well done. Uh, as one of the organizers pointed out to me, I should say at the beginning of the year, and this is, this is the Alshach year, and our third year of the Alshach year, our third series of the Alshach year. Remember, not too many people know about the Alshach, let alone learn the Alshach. Why not, if you enjoy the sharing, share it with somebody else um, so that they get the, the a taste and join our merry band of Alshach devotees every week? A nice idea. Uh, so please consider doing that. Of course, we dedicate this year at the beginning for people. Sometimes it's for a celebration, but more often it's for people who need a refuge shalema. So let's go through some of our regular uh, names that we daven for with tremendous sincerity that they should have a refuge shalema. Chaim, excuse me, Chaim Morchadov ben Esther should have a refuge shalema. Refo Chaim ben Sora should continue his upward trajectory and have a refuge shalema. Oriach Chaim. Ben Chana Yehudis, uh, who is the little boy waiting for the lung transplant, that should come speedily and be tremendously successful. Um, and then we added the la uh, last two weeks another little baby, a little baby boy, uh, who has sadly got a brain tumor, or tumor, as they say in America, and he is Aaron Yedidia Ben Sephora Chaba. Uh, he should have a refuge lema. Mira Riva Bas Sivia should have a refuge lema. Yechesko Yehuda ben Yenta should have for Shlema. He and his dear wife are celebrating their wedding anniversary today. Many happy of many happy and healthy war to them. Uh, Shmuel ben Chana and Chai Sunko ben Jamala. I think that is our um, list for this week. If you would like to dedicate the shear or have the shear dedicated uh, for a, a name of someone you hold dear uh, to celebrate the Simcha, to commemorate them or to wish them a refresh lima, please send me an email to yy at askrabbiyy.com yy at askrabbiyy.com That's the introductions out of the way. It is Erev Purim. Um, and wow, what a Purim type existence we are living through at this very moment, uh, are we not? And this is the week. I actually wrote, just I posted this on Facebook. Uh, I've just, it occurs to me, I must have joined the New Profit Society or the New Profit Club. Because I write a column um, for a, a couple of newspapers, and one of them is the Jewish Press. And I write it once a month. And almost every time I write about something, and this sounds very weird, and I'm, I've not gone mad and it's not ego, but almost everything I write about comes true uh, in the coming week because Jewish history is moving so quickly and so dramatically. Um, that Last week I, I talked about how our friends, quoting Echo, the beginning of Echo, how Jerusalem's friends and lovers uh, had turned against the, her and walked away from her. And I was saying that how the that so many of Israel's allies are doing, or in the process of doing the exact same thing. Well, I wrote that about two weeks ago, but this is the week when I, see, I read today, the United States is busy uh, preparing the draft of a motion, the United States to be submitted to the, to the UN, uh, demanding a legally binding ceasefire, uh, not short-term ceasefire, a legally binding ceasefire uh, in Gaza. In other words, uh, awarding a victory to the Hamas terrorists, people they recognize as being terrorists, uh, people whom they originally condemned, and of course people who are supported by uh, perhaps the most implacable enemy of the United States that the United States has, Iran. Uh, then of course we had the glorious spectacle, spectacle of Canada uh, stating that it will no longer supply or be supplied by Israel, its ally, uh, with any munitions or any any uh, defense equipment. Thank you, Canada. Uh, and I should say, of course, when you say thank you, Canada, there are lots of good Canadians. Uh, we're talking, of course, about Trudeau and his party, all left wingies. Um, and uh, then we've got the British uh, right wing uh, foreign secretary, ex prime minister, David Cameron, threatening to uh, cease arm, arms exports, etc. 
from Britain to its ally Israel uh, and to back similar moves in Europe if Israel doesn't do exactly what it says it should do, which is to allow uh, Hamas to claim a victory. Um, an existential uh, threat to the, uh, to the state of Israel. Yes. I thought, if, if I remember like last week, I would tell you a story at the beginning of each year. So in keeping with the rather uh, depressing theme of Amalek and modern day Amalek, um, or Amalekites, then let me tell you a story about somebody who definitely was an Amalekite. He was called Ray Hill. I may have mentioned this in some of my earlier share, I can't remember. Ray Hill was a non-Jew. Uh, and when he first came to speak to Jewish students at the University of Manchester, where I was the rabbi, I was extremely skeptical of the credentials of Mr. Ray Hill, who had been one of the founders of something called the British Movement, which was a neo-Nazi, post-war neo-Nazi party. He was a young working class lad from the north, um, from the greater Manchester area, who had uh, been recruited quite subtly and sneakily by the far right into, in his days in the British Army, into the far right uh, camp. And he grew and he became a totally devoted Nazi, grew in the ranks, became the deputy Fuhrer of the British movement. But deep down, there was a good man inside that, the, the, uh, that uh, evil facade. And encouraged by his wonderful wife, Glenn, um, that good man emerged. And he fought very, very hard to destroy the British movement and other neo-Nazi movements across the continent, because they're all linked, uh, and succeeded in doing so. His reward was that um, they tried to kill him and his family on three separate occasions. And we became very close friends. Ray and Glenn came to all of my uh, children's weddings. We worked together for something like 30 years. Sadly, very sadly, Ray passed away just a year or so ago, or a year ago. And uh, I remember we were driving to one university campus and we were talking about the fact that the Muslim population of the UK uh, were profoundly, surprise, surprise, not all again, but in its entirety, then clearly profoundly anti-Semitic, profoundly anti-Semitic. Um, and I was saying to Ray, uh, well, surely the, uh, the far right can't blame us, the Jews, for that one. They hit us as much as anybody else, if not more. So he looked at me as I was driving along in here and with his very uh, deep north of England uh, accent said, why, why? He said to me, do you know the story of the frog and the, and the scorpion? And I said, uh, no. So he told me that one day, it's a well-known story, there's a frog in a river and along comes a scorpion. He says, Mr. Frog, I'd like to get to the other side of the river. Please do me a favour. Let me ride on your back and swim across the river and deliver me to the opposite shore. The frog says, do you think I'm mad? If I take you on my back, you'll sting me and I'll die. The scorpion says, Mr. Frog, don't be an idiot. If I uh, uh, stab you with my, my little uh, poison prong uh, and you die, then I die. I'm riding in your back. I depend on you. Frog says, yeah, that's fair enough. Okay, jump on. Halfway across, the scorpion stings the frog. And the frog's dying words, he said, but now you're going to die. Why did you do that? And the scorpion says, I know, but I can't help it. It's in my nature. And Ray Hill, carrying on the conversation, said, to the far right mind, to the Nazi mind, then the Jew is the scorpion. It's innate within the Jew to want to destroy the host country in which he infests, um, even if it means his own destruction. And he started to tell me more and he said, the, the fascist has contempt and hatred for the black man. The fascist has contempt and hatred for the brown man and for the yellow man. But for the Jew, there is unparalleled loathing and hatred. You, he said, are the real enemy. Yes, uh, that's what real hatred is, real anti-Semitic hatred. Of course, it's not in any way unique to the left or to the right. Of course, at the moment, it's generally in the left. And what we're going through, what we're experiencing, is 
very, very 1930s stuff. And this week's Parsha, it's Vayikra, but it's also Parsha Zohar, where we've got the Mitzvah, the Mitzvah Deraisa, to remember what Amalek, Amalek, the quintessential anti Semites, what they tried to do to us when we come out into the desert and they attacked us for no reason. Even though the world was terrified of the Jewish people and what Hashem had shown through the Jewish people and the exodus from Egypt. The Moshe, as Rashi says, quoting the Medrash, is like somebody who throws himself into a bath of boiling water, a suicide plunger. In throwing himself into the, the boiling water, of course, he's going to be scalded to death and die a terrible death. However, in so doing, he'll absorb some of the energy of the water, some of the heat. It makes it easier for the next person who jumps in. Of course, they'll die too. But eventually, enough of them will die that they will have cooled down the water, making it possible for everybody to jump in. That was Amalek's mission in destroying or attacking the Jews for no reason. Their sinuskinum, their, their concept of total hatred, you are the real enemy, as Israel said, uh, was so, so uh, obsessive um, that they were willing to give up their lives as long as they killed lots of Jews in the process. Let's visit this idea of Amalek and Pasha Zohar because it's a mitzvah from the Torah to remember and be conscious of what they did to you. Somebody called Rebbe Friedlander says in Sissi Chaim a very interesting thing. Um, I'll read a little bit of this to you. Achaz Mitariag mitzvahs he mechias Amalek. One of the Tariag mitzvahs is to destroy Amalek. One of the 613 mitzvahs Destroy Amalek. Chalavis ki misuzu mitelas al kol Yisrael b'kol dar v'dar kol makom she Yehudi motzei she Yehudi motzei. This applies throughout the generations in any place where a Jew is found, whether it's in Scotland or Alaska or South Africa. Destroy Amalek. Anum ki misuzu the pole lo shach mizman azem. Of course, the actual practical application of doing the mitzvah of destroying Amalek. Is something which uh, is not it doesn't apply today. Because we don't know who Amalek are anymore. The nation of Amalek disappeared off the historical map. The Gemara says, the famous king. Uh, he was he mixed up all the nations in the Bible call arts, and so that the the the, the frontiers, the, the lines delineating one country and the other, they, they're all mixed up and nobody knows who Amalek is. So therefore, as it were, in theory, the, the mitzvah exists, but in, pra in practical application, it doesn't. Or doesn't it? But the Gemara Numa says, Gam Even if we're not able to do what the Torah demands that we do, which is to wipe out Amalek and remove them from under the, the, the heavens, we're still demanded and expected to hate a monarch and everything that he stands for. And to eradicate a malikness uh, as much as we are uh, able to do. Um, this myths of a Amalek, um, reading, jumping a little bit. This is tremendously interesting. I'll, I'll read the whole thing. It's just an interesting little paragraph. Um, the same concept seems to apply to myths which are similar to it. For example, Shari loy rak es amolik anu chayev limchaz ela av gam es shivas haamani. But also the seven nations when the Jewish people went and destroyed the land of Canaan, they were also commanded to destroy the Canaanites. But as Rakhine Friedlander points out from the halacha says, that's only if the Canaanites de decide, a, decide to fight against you and deny you entry to the land of Israel. But if they decide to move, to move aside, to move out, and there is no mitzvah to destroy uh, to destroy Amalek. More than that, it's to destroy the Canaanites. More than that, as we'll see shortly, um, the, there is no mitzvah to destroy Amalekites if they give up their Amalekite belief. 
that passionate hatred of the Jewish people. We'll come back to that idea in just a second. So the this, one of my books is called On the Derech, Answers to Questions that Challenge Jewish Minds. I'm afraid I'm not trying to sell this to you because it's completely out of print. Um, although I've been asked to um, bring out uh, version two or volume two, which I suppose would bring this back into life. Listen to this. One of the, the, the quintessential Jewish characteristics is meant to be Rachamim. We are Rachmoni b'nei Rachmoni. And if you find a Jew who's not Rachmoni, a Rachman b'nei Rachman, he was not somebody who is merciful and, pity, and, and has pity as his very description, um, then you're talking about somebody you can assume is not actually Jewish, even if he thinks he is or claims he is. The Jewish characteristic of mercy is, an, is not only anticipated, but demanded. Uh, when a Jewish judge sits considering the fate of someone whose life may have to end, again, Rav Ron Grudzinski, Rav Ron Grudzinski, one of the greats, uh, destroyed in the Holocaust, burned alive by the Nazis, says, not only do Dayanim have to be Rahmanim, not only do judges sitting in a capital case where they can hand out the death penalty have to be merciful in their nature, but they must be fathers. There's an interesting halacha. They have to be fathers. Um... You've got to imagine it's, I mean, after all, it is somebody's son standing in front of you being judged for his life. And you've got to imagine what that is like. Therefore, you have to be a father. And Ron Grzynski says, not only did I know how to run and mess with the nature, you must be fathers. The verse in the Torah says, I have to Rechel Kamaicha, you should love your neighbor, you should love yourself. Um, it's explained in the Gomorrah in Sanhedrin 52a as meaning that if someone has to be executed, if he has to be executed, you have to seek from a good death, not a cruel death, but a quick, a good death. The demand to seek a good death, he says, extends equally to non-Jewish people. If they have killed, sorry, if you have to, if they have to be killed, I should say, we have to try if possible to make our enemy's death a good one. Um, none of that, though, will uh, make anyone reading this feel any easier about the Torah's commandment to wipe out Moloch. It doesn't sit well with us, does it? the idea to wipe out a people, even if the people are effectively the SS, whose whole life goal is the destruction of the Jewish people. Even if the people is the Palestinians, who 77 or 78% approve of the October 7 uh, micro-Holocaust and, and long to do it again, um, it doesn't make us feel any good the fact we have to kill them. A simple verse of the Chumash is, is not Judaism, of course. So even though a verse says something, we have to say what the halacha says. So here's what the halacha says, having been discussed through the Talmud. The Rambam, who discusses the obligation to wipe out a Malik, continues with scores of other halachas on the subject of warfare and its conduct. In the sixth chapter of Pilchas Malachim, he writes, we can never make war on anyone under any circumstances until we first offer them peace. This applies whether the war is one mandated by the Torah or one that occurs later in the initiative of a king or the Sanhedrin. For example, if the Jewish land is, uh, is and Jewish people are attacked, and then the government has to go to war, as they did in Gaza. If they accept peace, if the enemies accept peace, and abandon mm -hmm. idolatry and accept the seven Noachite commandments, mm -hmm. then not one soul among them may be harmed. They may become part of the Jewish commonwealth. They can be part of the, of the, larger, um, the larger Jewish family uh, and live there quite happily. So Basically, that applies to Amalek as well. And further in the same chapter, the Rambam writes, war is mandated only if the people refuse to make peace and accept the seven Nochai commandments. But if they do, whether they're Canaanite inhabitants of the land of Israel or Amalek, they must not be touched. Hmm. So therefore, there is no justification for the wiping out of a people because they are a people. You wipe out people because only because they intend to destroy you. Um, the classic commentator on the Rambam, the case of Mishnah, puts in these words, if they accept upon themselves seven of the High Commandments, they stop being seen as the people of the, of the nations of Canaan or a Malik. There is no commandment to kill a Malik and a Malik because of his race or peoplehood, but only if it's for his philosophy and moral view. It's not a question of what he is, but what he does. That's rather interesting and important, I think. Um, and that's why the first 
taking this idea forward. And that's why the first Jewish king came from the tribe, not of Yehuda, from which tribe all Jewish kings must come. There was an exception for, for the first Jewish king. And why is that? Because the, when you go into the land of Israel, the three commandments that uh, start straight away. One is appoint a Jewish king. Two is to wipe out Amalek. Number two. But if Amalek abandon their Nazi philosophy, then there is no commandment to do that. So why does it have to be a king from the tribe of Binyamin? Well, not from Yehuda. Because if you have a uh, a commandment to wipe out somebody because of their Amalaki, their Amalekness, their hatred of Jews and the want and uh, people who want to destroy Jews for no reason, then the Jew who would be carrying out that mitzvah must he himself be free of that same hatred. And all of the Jewish tribes were guilty of baseless hatred towards other Jews. That was the brothers' hatred of Yosef. Only one wasn't, that was his brother Binyamin, who had no part in the, the hatred of Yosef or the selling of Yosef. Consequently, he, as they say in English, people in glass houses can't throw stones. The first Jewish king, if his, his role was to destroy Amalek, cannot be in any way guilty of the same crime himself. Um, not only that, and here's an astonishing concept, um, that the Amalekite thing, the Amalekite disease, Indeed, as we just said, it's not so astonishing. Um, it existed before um, there was an Amalek. Uh, existed before uh, there was the Jewish people as we know it. This you'll find in in Bereshis, and it's in, in the set of Lechlecha, and in Yudalad, and it is well, it's the story of the four war, the four kings against uh, the four kings against the five kings, and Avram Avinu gets involved in the war and says. His, his nephew Lot, um, um, Lot, who has been captured um, by the four kings. This is what the Medrash says. Listen to this Medrash. It says the Alshah. The Alshah quotes the Medrash and says, of the four kings, Amrofel, Melech, Shainar, because four kings, does that ring a bell? This hints of the prophetic dream which Jacob saw the four angels going up to heaven and coming down the ladder. Um, and he recalls uh, that, uh, or he realizes that this is a prophecy uh, about the four com countries, nations, which would control the Jewish people, and how many rungs they went up on the ladder, steps in the ladder, the number of years that they would control the Jewish people. So there would be four kings, four uh, uh, regimes that would control the Jewish people. Four kings. Here is a prophetic predecessor. So the four kings of this battle, four kings and the five kings, says the following. Embracious Rabba, Membase Hay, Amrothel, the king Amrothel, Melech Shinar, Ze Bovel. That was referred to the king of Bovel, who would come in the future. Erech Melech Eloser Ze Modai. Modai, that takes us to the Purim story. Second king, Cardal Omer, and Melech Ilem Ze Yovon. That's the Greek exile or dominance of the Jewish people. But Tedal, Melech Goim, and Tedal, the king of the nations, the Edom. That was Edom. Edom, of course, is the father of Esau. And but Edom, the Elisha says, this is insane. Edom had been born yet. This is the time of Avram Avinu. The Yitzhak's not been born. Yaakov's not been born. So there is no Esau. And there's certainly no you know, Amalek. This scary Medrash is telling you that what Amalek is, what Amalek stands for, can transfer between peoples. Uh, is The hatred of the Jews is has always been there in the world from the get-go. It became intense at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, the Talmud says, Sinai, Sina. Jew, hatred of Jews was engendered, uh, not engendered, was uh, multiplied from the story of, of us being at Mount Sinai. And it's always been there. And Jews, we ourselves can be guilty of this. We ourselves can be guilty of this. Um, is there a cure? Well, there is a cure, and it's really quite obvious. When, if I go back to the Asha again, but now I turn to Parshas Noach, um, saying we're talking about um, various kings, 
Here's another one, Nimrod. And we all know that he makes the Tower of Babel, and astonishingly, you now this is one of the deepest parts of the of, of the Torah, but he wants to fight with God. Fight with God. If you have to fight with somebody, you, you accept that somebody is there. So it would seem to be that to, to want to pick a fight with God is an, uh, an exercise in insanity, not just futility, but insanity. Or is it? Let's just remind ourselves of what happened in that story. But you call it or it's Sheva Achat Machod. The entire world was um, one had one language, which was Hebrew, by the way, but Devorim Achodim, and they were speaking Devorim Achodim, words of oneness. Um, and then they travel from the east to the west, and they find a valley, in the land of Shinar, and they dwell there. Uh, and each man says to his friend, So let's uh, begin a building project. They're going to build, uh, they're going to make bricks and they're going to build a tower. Uh, let's make for ourselves a city, Umigdal, uh, with a tower which will go over Russia, the Shemaim. And we'll make for ourselves a name. Penofits al pene colors, lest we be scattered through the whole of the land. Avram Avinu, who is alive and witnessing this, davens to God. God comes down, sees what they are up to, and says an astonishing thing. The year of Shem, the rest is a year. That's the middle. God comes down to see the city and the tower. Asher bona bene honem, which the people have made. The Yamar, Hashem, Hain am echod, Besefa achas, they are one people with one language. As this is what they started to do. Nothing will be withheld from withheld from them to achieve and stop them achieving their ambition. Except if I undo the elements which gave guarantee their success. The number one element, as Rashi points out, in the contrasting the door of the flood to the door of the Tower of Bovel, which was worse. The Tower of the Flood, uh, sorry, Tower of Flood, the, ge the, the generation of the Flood, um, they were not kind to each other, to put it mildly. They mugged each other, they stole each other's stuff, uh, but they didn't try and fight with God. These people are literally trying to fight with God, which was worse. Now, Rashi says that what was worse was the fact that they hated each other. Where the, even though there were the plan of Nimrod and the people of that generation was indeed to kill God or kill God from the world um, in the 20th century and in the 19th century, they used, the philosophers used to say God is dead. Um, to remove God from the world, uh, that was offset by the fact they had one language and they were united. And they wanted to make a negative copy of Yerushalayim. Let's come back to this idea of a negative copy of the Jewish people and what we are up to in a second. They moved from the east to the west. Israel's in the east. Um, they built a city with a tower. Does that ring a bell? Jerusalem is a, is a city, the walls and the tower, Migdal David. And they want to go to heaven to fight with God. How would they set up an aisle there? You see, one of the things that we're saying at the beginning when it says they have one language, and Devorah Machodim, they're talking about one thing. They were talking about the one thing was the one un a standout in the world. The one person stood against the world. Avram Ivri. Ivri means different and separate to everybody else. And they said he's one. He can't have any children. He is not really a threat to us. So they were going to replace, and the plan was to replace the Jewish people. And that is a plan which has repeated itself many, many times. If you, uh, the, the church calls itself the new Israel. If you ever go to Paris and you're to go and visit the, the cathedral uh, called Sacre Coeur, you'll find that the bishop's chair, the cathedra, Latin word for chair, has a, a star of David in the back. They are the new Israel. Islam said the exact, says the exact same thing. They are the real guys. They are the real Jews. It's so often the case that they come to try and replace us. I'll tell you something really terrible. This is from the Shem Mishmuel. Um, remember in Haggadah, which we are coming to, to read again very soon, has said, 
if and if we didn't, if Hashem hadn't taken us out from Israel the moment he did, uh, it says um, us and our uh, honor, Benino, 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 our children and grandchildren, we'd still be enslaved to, to Pharaoh in Egypt. And the Hashem Ishmael says, that makes no sense. Because we learn in, 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 the, in the Talmud and we from the Possek and Bereshus, Bereshus Borel, the Kim's Shrine, but that's the worst. Hashem created the world. Uh, in order for Rishis, Rishis is a euphemism for the Jewish people. If the Jewish people had not accepted the Torah at Mount Sinai, there would be no resin to the world, says the Gemara, and the world would return to the state it was before, which is Tohu Vavohu, which is usually translated as nothingness, Tohu Vavohu, uh, to which, asked the Shemesh, well, in that case, this is insanity. If it says that had the Jewish people not accepted the the, the, the Torah at Mount Sinai, the world will go back to Torah. Uh, sorry, it, sorry, I'm getting mixed up. If the Jewish people uh, had uh, Hashem had not taken us taken us out, we would still be slaves to, uh, to to Pharaoh in Egypt. There would be no Egypt. It's only because we came to Mount Sinai, accepted the Torah, that the world has a resident it would continue. But if we had uh, Hashem hadn't taken us out. Would be no Egypt, we wouldn't be stuck there being slaves to because the world will go back to nothingness. Yes, no, says the Shemesh Mishmo. Before it says in Bereshis, the world before Shem starts to form it is Tohovavo, says the Shemesh Mishmo something very interesting. Tohovavo is a state, a state of existence. There is a way the world can exist without the Jews. Nimrod knew that there could be a world without the Jews. It would be an evil world, a vile world. Imagine a world where the Nazis won. Imagine a world where the Islamo Nazis win. And if you find that difficult to imagine, that the Muslims controlling uh, in the, a, a radical Islamist takeover of the whole world, if you find that difficult to imagine, then I suggest you just talk to some Muslims and they will enlighten you because they find it not in, in any difficult, not for, without any difficulty, easy to imagine. And so many are struggling to achieve that, exactly that, with their allies, who now include, include David Cameron, the British Foreign Secretary, uh, Trudeau of, of Canada, and uh, probably the White House of the United States of America. What's to be done? Well, the first thing is to remember we're coming to Purim. Uh, as bad as it is at the moment, it's not as bad as, as it was facing the Jews then, with the decree that all the Jews are being taken out and slaughtered. That was pure Nazi stuff, a complete replica. We're not there, thank God, yet. But is there anything to be done? If the success of our enemies is when they have achdus, can we think of perhaps something that might have triggered our failure uh, and the attack of October the 7th? like all those million people in the, street, in the streets of Tel Aviv, and many, uh, many Hamas fighters interviewed, interviewed the wrong word, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Interrogated. Interrogated by Israeli intelligence. It made it quite clear that it was the, the very um, uh, disunity of the Jewish people that encouraged uh, their attack. So let's finish on a positive note. There is an antidote to that, and that is to regain, to, to sustain, and look for every single opportunity to create unity. Let's finish with the Vilna Gaon. Vilna Gaon's analysis of the words of the wisest man who ever lived, Shlomo Melech. In Mishli, Proverbs, in Yud Tess, and it's Posit Yud, it says the following thing. Seichel Odom Herich Apoi. A man of intelligence or wisdom, Herich um, Apoy, dilutes his anger, stretches it out, doesn't react straight away. But the Teferis, but the splendor of a person, is to overlook and forgive when somebody upsets you, attacks you, badmouths you. Let me read to you what the Vilna Gaon says. The Vilna Gaon says, Svato over al pesha. Ki amarich apoy. The first category it says, it says a wise person doesn't strike back straight away. Right? But he's still not forgiven the guy. The, the disharmony, the bragas, the freebo, the maklaukas is still alive. 
Uh, but the, and that doesn't give him to Ferris. That doesn't give him splendor. It doesn't crown him. What crowns a person is when he makes peace, causes peace to be made. Uh, carry on reading. especially Somebody who is controlling his anger so he doesn't react immediately and horribly. And as it were, it gets cooler and cooler, but he's, it's still there. He's just, he's just controlled his anger. But you're not, you're not, this, there's no credit, there's no great credit from that. Somebody who forgives the offense, then he forgives everything that's done and done, uh, has been done to him and wipes the slate clean. That is when a person, Shlomo Malik is telling us, should be and really is uh, to be honored. Um, she to Ferris Lodom, because that is what makes a person unique and splendid. Gizu Hamilas Bekol Hamidas Atibas. And that is much sorry, Zuha Maula Mikol Hamidas Atibas. And that to be able to um, overlook offense when somebody's hurt your feelings, that makes you great. It's the best Mida of all the Midas. Kamosha Omri says, Kol Mabira Midoisav, Mavira and Loy Kol Bishop. And the reward for that is if you do that to somebody else. Hashem will do it to you. If we're doing it to lots of somebody else's, if we're building unity, then Hashem will reward that unity. And that's where we're holding at the moment. And it's, of course, an echo of the Purim story. When the Jewish people found their unity again, listened to the voice, filled the shoals, fasted as we did today, Tana Sester. Um, and that, of course, led to a great celebration and a great victory. Our disunity is always our downfall. Our unity is always our success. The brochus from Hashem always come when we display unity as something that we can easily do. That's Zecher Amalek, a constant state that a Jew has to have, remembering the story of Amalek. To remember the story of the Amalek is to remember our own story, where we find Amalek or bits of Amalek in us. And what causes our destruction is that presence. What ceases our destruction, reverses it, is when we purge that presence. Most everybody, a freilich and Purim, Purim Sameach, and Shalom Yisrael, and Sloch of Klal Yisrael. And I'm hoping that Purim brings us specially good news this year. Wishing you all good Shabbos, Shabbat Shalom. See you next week.